Good morning. Morning. Just like to thank Tom for giving me a welcome earlier, uh, pointing out that I slipped in two minutes late casually. That was. It looked smooth, but actually it was a swan. The feet were going like mad underneath. You have no idea. Let me just excuse myself. With I could give you loads of reasons why I was coming the way I did, but I was persuaded last week, and I fell for it, and we got a pop. <laughs> This is a, six, a 59 year old man who got a pup who two days later realised that if that pup lives to 15, I'll be 74. <laughs> and the day after we got the pup, we got home at night at 10 o'clock with this poor little creator who had just left his siblings and his mum and dad and he just looked lost. And then the next day, Timothy and Jane went to work and the next day and left me with him. There's only one verse I can quote for this. <laughs> be not, do not be deceived. A man will reap what he sows. Okay. Actually, after being at work the next two days and coming home, it actually was a joy to come home to that wee living critter. Uh, sometimes. <laughs> By the way... Um, Thank you, Brian. It was still brilliant when you were up here. Okay? That's where the brilliant ends. but... We are still in John chapter 1. And let me seriously give you some background to why I'm in John chapter 1. Because <clears throat> I, don't call, I don't think myself as, a, as one of the great saints, but... If you read any of the, the great people, because they write stuff, I haven't written anything, but they write stuff, and I think it was one of the uh, one of the Wesley brothers that wrote, he had come out of the long night of the soul. And uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great preacher who wrote so much on Romans, his commentary nearly reaches from one side of that room to the other, and it took him 15 or 20 years to get through it in the church he was in. He, he wrote a book called Spiritual Depression, and we all go through times when we are really dry. And when people ask me to speak, I think, well, you've asked me, but I do not know what I'm going to speak on, and I struggle getting prepared. But John chapter 1 just took me by surprise because I just kept reading it. And it has saved my faith, in a sense. It, 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 it is the central, at this point in my life, it is the central verse in the Bible for me. This portion is. And that will change over time because there have been others. But this is central to everything that the Bible has to say. And I, I might come back again in, in May and speak on this again. I don't know. But I started reading the Bible this year from the start to finish again. I haven't done it for a while the whole Bible. And because I've been reading this hundreds and hundreds of times, Jesus really is, as people say, on every page of the Bible, every single page. And I'm not talking about a forced uh, interpretation of different things and that. I just feel him in every situation. He's there. He is the central figure of the whole Bible. We don't know it. Someone said you only understand the Old Testament when you've got saved and read the New Testament. And the New Testament makes the Old Testament understood and, and it comes alive when you, when you know Jesus. So forgive all that. Let's read John chapter 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. What's this about? Who is Jesus? And I might repeat some of what I said the last time because I didn't write any of it down and I haven't written anything down this time. But There was a man travelling to Korean from Belfast. He's a city dweller. And instead of staying on the bypass at Balamina, he went off into Balamina and he ended up lost. And seeking some directions, he stopped with a local in Balamina and he said, can you tell me how you get to Korean from here? And the man from Balamina said, my brother takes me. <laughs> How do you get to God? A lot of our preaching is about how to get to heaven, but the only reason we really should want to get to heaven is that we've got to God. Our desire to go to heaven is not to escape hell and live forever, which is true. But our desire is to go to heaven to be with God because he saved us from hell and we will live forever. And Jesus came into the world so that if I had read to the end, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only son who is with the father has made him known. And for a person who went to Glastry School and wanted to know the answer before he had done any of the work. For a person who, I try never to do this, but if you read the last page of the novel and the first page of the novel, you can make up a story in between, okay? But, and John knew that, he was a fisherman. He, he probably wasn't that academic, so he wrote at the end of his gospel, in fact, the chapter before the end, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book I've just written. So if you skipped it all, don't worry. Uh, I didn't record everything anyway. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life. In his name. The only reason he wrote it was that you would have life, not, not eternal life in heaven, on a cloud, escaping hell, but you would have life in the name of Jesus Christ. Life, real life, the way God intended life to be. There are millions of people out there that have completely missed that. And I will risk to say that there is no one within this hall this morning that has completely grasped that. We are on a journey. We're still... And this, this, th these few words try to get at you to say, look, who do you really, really think Jesus is? He is the eternal God. In the beginning was the word. Now, I maybe spoke from a, a, theor a, the a theoretical point of view last time that 
why did John write that? And I said that he wrote it for the Jews, that as soon as they saw in the beginning, they were like, whoa, hold on a minute. That sounds very like our Torah, the very start of it, Genesis ch chapter 1, in the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, and they were thinking God spoke creation into life, so this is something to say to us. And he's trying to get the thinkers down in, in uh, Athens to think about this to the Greeks. And they're all thinking about everything that, that's new every day. And you know what? Human beings have not changed at all. Because why do so many newspapers sell every day still? And if you don't buy one, you get it on your online or you watch the news or you think... We're still always thinking about what the new thing is, reading about the latest thing. And John was starting this to grab your attention if you want to know what it's all about. There's only one word you need to know. And it starts with a J and ends with an S. And his name is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was always there. Before history began, he was there way back in eternity. He always was. And the Word was God. Now, that was a shocker. I said that the last time, to the Jews especially. This, this Word was God, but... Tied up in this word is the dynan dyn, dyn, I can't even get words today. Dyn, dynamic dynamism. The par, because that's what dynamic means, dynamite, the par. Tied up in this word is the par of all creation. So he tells us that through him all things were made. And, and how did he make it? He just spoke it. He, he is that word that was spoken into creation. And one of the reasons I'm late this morning is that I always try to do this before I go and preach. I walk the beach. And I looked at the tide coming. And I always tell you this. And I looked at the sky. And I looked at the stand. And I looked at all those boulders along Valley Halbert Beach. Which is fantastic for that. And every single one of them has been rounded by that incredible, powerful sea that tosses and turns them. And I'm incredibly amazed every time there's a storm how, how strong that, we, that sea is to bring all more boulders up and more. And how it moves them, I do not know. But there's not a sharp edge on any of them. And if every single person in here this morning went out there and collected 10,000 of those boulders off that beach, you wouldn't notice that any had gone. And Jesus spoke all that. And that's just that beach I'm talking about. Who is Jesus? Who, who died on the cross for you? He died on the cross for you that in him you would have life. Start to understand life. You wouldn't have to sit around every day thinking, what is the meaning of life? And looking up, what's the latest on this life thing? What, 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 what's the latest wisdom? Oh, let's all get together and talk about that on Tuesday night. What's the latest thing? Jesus sells us it all. If you got to know the person who made the universe you get to know something. That's why when you spend time with Jesus, um, thoughts come into your mind, Brian, when you spend time with Jesus, thoughts come into your mind that blow your mind. And yes, often they do feel far more brilliant at home than they do when you get up here. I'm, I'm struggling as well. Do you know sometimes it seems far brilliant when somebody else is preaching to you and you think, I must preach about something like that the next time. Uh, boys are dear, it's far harder to do, that, to do it than to listen to it. So, To be honest, I feel I'm growing into the person you always knew I was. Someone called me a nobody once. It's taken me a while to understand that he was right. 
A consultant psychiatrist once said to me, your wife has a higher IQ than you. Even though I've realized that for quite some time, I'm still getting my head around it. But I am growing into the person you always knew that I was, okay? But this stuff, this stuff speaks to the most ordinary of people. You don't need to be a theologian to get this. You just need to read this. If I challenge you with anything, read, and, and you can't get your head around anything else, just read these 18 verses every day, 10 times a day, 20 times a day, 10 times at lunchtime, 10 times at tea time, 10 times before you go to bed, 10 times in the morning before you leave the house. This, this person, Jesus, gets you. And if he doesn't get you, you, you haven't got him. And you need to get him. But I did want to move on to something here. Through him all things are made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not understood it. Now, I said the last time that if you read the rest of John, which I have been trying to do on a regular basis and not succeeding very well, but because I keep getting stuck at certain chapters, which is no bad thing at times. But if you read John, there are certain chapters that come alive because of this introduction that John has written. And chapter 9 is very important to understand this concept of light. In chapter 8 and verse 12, it simply says this, that when Jesus stood up again to speak to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. And people could, there was a whole lot of argument about that. The Jews, the Pharisees said, you're just a witness for yourself, etc., etc., read it. But chapter 9 is much more practical. Chapter 9 is about the story of a blind man that was healed, and that encouraged me, but it was the wrong one you were singing about, because this guy didn't say a word. Just look at what it says in chapter 9, and the whole chapter is about this one miracle. As he went along, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, it doesn't give us any details how John knew he was blind from birth. We don't need to know that. But we do need to know that he was blind from birth. No doubt Jesus knew he was blind from birth. But the fact that Jesus saw him, he didn't see Jesus, Jesus saw him, should be of great encouragement to every single person in here who feels a wee bit lost this morning, who struggles, who feels left out, who feels that maybe nobody sees me, or and even the people who you look at who think, oh, they're at the centre of things, they have times when they think, ah, oh, I'm really struggling here. But Jesus saw this man. As he went along, he saw a blind man. A man, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, in him was life, and that light was the light of man. Every man. The true light that comes into the world that was to be the light of every man. That's what John chapter 1 says. And then John chapter 9 has us meeting, Jesus meeting this man blind from birth. Can you, can you put yourself in his sandals for a while? Imagine, to, close your eyes for a moment and imagine that has been your life, all of your life. All of your life has been this with your eyes closed. You haven't been able to get a job. You haven't been able to leave home. You still live with your mum and dad. You're just, uh, and you're brought out every day to, to beg for a living. He was begging to live and living to beg. 
That's what his life was. He was caught in this incredible circle, this this awful circle of living to beg and begging to live. He needed to beg to stay alive and he needed to stay he needed to just beg to live. And his disciples, Jesus' disciples asked a very Jewish theological question, did this man sin or did his parents sin? Because there was something in the psyche that said that something, somebody must have sinned that this, this man was born blind. And they even were making the point that in some strict Jewish circles that a child could have committed some sort of sin to, of, to be worthy of being born blind. While in the mother's womb. And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. I've been thinking a lot about reading through John, reading through the gospel. And you know what, There's, there is a positive to sickness when you read through the Gospels. Nowhere did I read that thousands of well people crowded round houses to see Jesus. It was sick people. Their sickness drove them to Jesus to find a cure. Hallelujah for their sickness in some ways. It was a sign of sinfulness in the world. But it drove them to Jesus, who was the answer both to their sickness and to their sin. And he did that on a number of occasions where he healed someone and then he said, go and sin no more. Or he healed a man or, or he said to a man, uh, your sins are forgiven. And all the Jews complained about it. And then uh, he said to them, well, what's easier? Hi, guys, what's easier here? If I said to that guy, take up your mat and walk, what would be easier? Or so uh, I will. I'll say to him. Here, take up your mat and walk. And the man rolled up his mat and walked out. And Jesus just looked at at the Pharisees and said, I have authority to forgive sin. This is your Jesus. Sproul, the great theologian, says that people often asked him, why do bad things happen to good people? And he said, I always answer, that only happened once, and he volunteered. There are no really good people. We are all caught in in sin. We are all born in sin, shaped in iniquity. That's the way we come into the world, because Adam and Eve sinned, and their children sinned. And it's in us. We inherit sin. We are sinful human beings. And bad things happen to all of us because sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. Mate, there's a bit more debate between Jesus and his disciples, but for time we'll move quickly. Chapter, verse 6, chapter 9. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home saying. Isn't that amazing? A wee bit of Jesus spit. I just thought about that during the week. A wee bit of... Why did he do it that way? No, I mean, there are probably thousands of pages written on why he did it that way. I just love the whole idea of it, and I, I just some theologians say a lot of rubbish, some make a lot of it. But my mind goes directly to the garden when Ma, when God created man out of the dust of the earth, and 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 he made mud out of the dust with his own saliva, and he rubbed it on the man's eyes. Now, if I spat in your eyes, you would go and wash immediately. And do that would be a very good thing because there's all manner of things in our breath and in our saliva. Look at the saving power in this one person's saliva. Is he not perfect? Now, I'm not making a big thing of that, but 
That's how Jesus done it. He made mud and he applied it to the man's eyes and the man went and washed and he came home seeing. Now when he got home, his neighbours had a whole argument about it. They said, his neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And they had a problem. They were like, does this guy look, does he have a double? Some said, some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he just looks like him. But he himself said, I am the man. It's not somebody else, it's me. And I've never saw you, but I have no idea who you are. But this is me. Because I've always been in this body. And I was blind, but now I can see. It's the first time I saw myself, actually. So I have no idea if you're right or wrong either. But I know from personal experience that it's me. People out there might, you know, if they saw me on an average day, And I let Jesus down on, on an average day. I do let him down a lot. If you don't, you're amazing. If people saw me on an average day, they might say, is that the man who used to preach at Belly Halbert? Some would say, no, I think it is. And others would say, no, I think it's a boy that just looks like him because he, he, he shouldn't be doing that. But I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved because Jesus touched me. Jesus saw me and Jesus touched me. I'll tell you from personal experience, he's working on me. I am better than I used to be. I see more flaws in me than I ever did before, but I know I'm not the person I was. I'm not the person that I want to be, but I will be that person because when I meet him face to face, I shall be like him and I will be perfect. And it's his work to do the work in me, not even mine. And yes, I strive every day to live better. But you know what? Every time I say I'm going to do better, within usually seconds or minutes of doing that, I say, think or do something that I shouldn't do because I'm a sinner. And this man said, no, I am the man. But he himself insisted, I am the man. <coughs> How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, and listen to this, he replied. He replied. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed and then I could see. And who's central to this now? It's not even the man anymore. He says it's the man they called Jesus. Made mud, put it on my eyes and sent me and I did what he told me to do. There's a wee simple thing we could learn, isn't it? If we simply read the Bible more and did what Jesus tells us to do, Jesus says to his disciples, and he's talking to the apostles, and none of them were perfect until they went to be with him in heaven. He said to them, if you keep my commands, uh, you will show the world that you're saved. Love one another. This is how the world will know. Do all the things I'm telling you to do. And God, to Jesus told this man to go and wash and he came back and he was seeing. Now, he's, he's not in the full picture yet. The people wanted some more ver verification. So they thought, you know what? If, if we want to find out what a miracle's about, we'll go and see the theologians. So they did. They went to see the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees a man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Was that a big mistake or did Jesus think? Hmm. And here, here is maybe the answer to the question. Why did Jesus spit on the ground and make mud? 
because he wanted to teach the Pharisees a lesson about the Sabbath. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man said, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. And now there's a bit of a division in the Pharisaical ranks. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man, who wasn't blind at this stage, who had been blind. <coughs> what have you got to say about this? About him. It was your eyes he opened. The man replied. He is a prophet. He's getting somewhere this man. You see, he, he, he's not theologically trained. He probably wasn't able to keep up with the other guys. When they were doing their training in the Torah. All those Jewish young men. And he maybe was made to sit at the back. And you're blind. You'll not be able to follow the scrolls anyway. And maybe he listened in really carefully. And he thought to himself. You know what? He, he must be something. If he's able to open my eyes. I was blind from birth. And today I saw the sun for the first time. I saw people for the first time. I have even saw you Pharisees for the first time. Would you not think of getting a haircut? The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still not, did not believe that he had been blind and, they re, and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they said? They asked him, is this your son? They asked, is this, is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can now see? And his parents said, we know he is our son. The parents answered, and we know he was blind, born blind. But how he can now see, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Asked him, he is of age. And then John explains this to us. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time the Pharisees summons the man, a second time they summons the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. Tell the truth. Come on. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. You're the theologians. Work it out. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And what do you call that old villain that wrote to him, Amazing Grace? Did he, did he write this down and say, these are the words of a blind man? Or did, was that whole him plagiarism? That's what I want to know. I was blind, but now I see, said the blind man. I know it. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> this guy is a theologian, by the way. He's a debater. Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciples. We are the disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the blind man then replied. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this the Pharisees hurled some more insults. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Which just reminds me of something Billy Strachan once said. If a church ever throws you out, don't feel that you've been excluded. Feel, feel that you've been freed. Uh, look at this, but Jesus didn't forget this man. He opened his physical eyes. And he has let a certain and a short amount of time pass by for this man's spiritualized to start to open to for him to think about who possibly could have opened my eyes and he's well on track to believing in jesus but he hasn't got the final part yet and he has to meet jesus face to face because he hasn't saw him yet <laughs> and jesus heard that they had thrown him out and jesus must have went and found him and when he had found him he said do you believe in the son of man the blind man said, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Time's gone. Look back at John chapter 1. So that is a test piece for what John says in John chapter 1. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness is not understood it or overcome it. And you can put both readings in there together because the darkness has not understood it or has the darkness overcome it, and it never will. There came a man sent from God, his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, Jesus. The one who can open the eyes of a man born blind, live for it. doesn't tell you how old he is, but he's, 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 of a, he's lived quite a few years. Because everybody knows him as a blind beggar. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. And there's no one hopeless. If you're listening at home or you're in here this morning and you think, well, it's not for me. I'm, I'm too far gone. This is a test case. This was a guy who had never seen and who could never see unless he met Jesus. And not only were his eyes opened spurt physically but his eyes were open spiritually and he worshipped Jesus look at that last verse again in John chapter 1 at the start no one has ever seen God but God the one and only who is at the Father's side has made him known this man worshipped God when he fell at Jesus feet he's seen God Do you know what? We all, we all need to keep growing in our spiritual life. The doctrine of total depravity doesn't, a famous theologian has said, the doctrine of total depravity doesn't mean that we are all as completely evil as we possibly could be in every area, but it actually means that we are in every area not, and no area as good as we possibly should be to meet God's requirements. I spoke with a man this week who told me how good he was and, and he's a really good man. And I said, but your problem is that you're never going to be good enough to meet God that way. You need Jesus. And we left disagreeing. But that's the truth. 
There was a guy caught stealing stuff out of the cars in the multi-story car park at the hospital. And he was up in court and the judge said to him, this is wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Some people in here might think you've made it. You haven't. Your life is messed up in every level some way. You need Jesus to open your eyes every day. He is the light that gives light to every man. I know one man that's going to be in heaven. I don't know him personally. John very kindly wrote down his story for me. It's an incredible miracle. And Jesus wants to do that to you as well every day. That's why you need to spend time with him every day. Father, thank you that you love us so much. Your word is practical and kind and full of grace. And yet it very clearly points out that we're sinful and we need a saviour. Thank you that in the beginning was the saviour and the saviour was with God and the saviour was God. He was with God in the beginning. And he is the word of life and his name is Jesus. Help us to seek him out. Let us, when he nudges us and wants to speak to us, let him speak to us the way he found this man. And we thank you that you love us and you care and you're interested in each of us. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.